Okay. Hello, everybody. Vanda me Nice to meet you again. Seems like you have there another device open because I can hear the echo from you. So what's the plan? Uh, Vandam Bante, uh, you can start Bante the course. Uh, uh, sorry about the echo. Uh, Bante, I'll have to mute myself because I'm streaming, live streaming it online. And so I can't I on my mic without it uh, getting. I see. I think you can turn off the sound. You can take that sound from the live stream into uh, earbuds so that uh, you can hear it in the earbuds. What is the live stream? So you can check it. And uh, you can use speaker in the device where you, yeah, where you see me. <laughs> So, where are you live streaming this? Where are you live streaming this and what is the program? Okay, very good. And what is the program? It will be good if you can introduce the class. Uh, Vanda Mebante, uh, this class is uh, is about uh, the working of karma, and we are following this uh, book by Venerable Paok Sayado with the same title. And uh, I would want to invite you, Bante, uh, to start the class uh, to uh, elucidate uh, the meanings of uh, the Theravada teachings and working of karma as per this book, Bante. Mm -hmm. um, so you want? Uh, so you would? Uh, so you expect me to? Um, guide the listeners through the book uh, right away or is there anything else you would like to do first uh, bande it's all up to you uh, whatever uh, you feel uh, comfortable bande hmm. so i think it will be very good if we can start by meditation what do you think about that uh, yeah, that's fine, Bante. So you can choose. Would you like, uh, would you suggest 10 minutes or 15 minutes of meditation? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, it's up to you. 15 minutes may be okay, Bante. We can start. We can have that as the uh, program, Bante. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So let's sit in a comfortable meditation posture. When you meditate with me, you will be learning a lot of new things because 
Um, I like to teach new things which are in accordance with the scriptures and which are in accordance with the commentaries and sub-commentaries. So in the sub-commentaries, we get a very interesting information, namely that we should not meditate in an ordinary meditation posture. We should meditate in a special meditation posture. Interestingly, this also makes sense from the point of view of modern psychology. Well, relatively modern, namely uh, from uh, the standpoint of classical conditioning. If we can choose a meditation posture which is special only for meditation, and we don't use it for anything else, then whenever we sit in meditation in that posture, the mind will immediately know and be classically conditioned into calming down. So whatever is the posture that you use for walking, for, no, for talking and um, reading and eating and resolving problems and uh, listening to things and so on. That's not a posture suitable for meditation. So for example, the posture where you keep one of your calves on the, where you keep one of your calves on the foot of the other leg and another calf on the foot of yet the other leg. This posture actually is an amazing posture for talking about Dhamma, but it is not a good posture for meditation at all. Instead, if you want to meditate, it's very good to assume the so-called Burmese posture, where you keep both legs on the floor, the feet, the calves, knees, as well as the thighs, all of them are on the floor. Another option is keeping one foot between placed, gently placed. Some people happen to dig the foot in. That's wrong. Should not happen. Must be gently placed over um, the uh, bent portion or between the thigh and the calf. Another version is keeping the foot on the thigh. So these are three versions of meditation posture that are described in the commentaries and sub-commentaries of the Pali scriptures keeping all legs on the floor, foot between the thigh and the calf, and foot on the thigh. Very rarely we will find a mention of so-called Mahapalanka. But even this Mahapalanka, I personally would discourage from it if your knee is levitating above the floor like this. This should not happen. If you sit like this in your Mahapalanka, then simply you are not sitting in Mahapalanka. It's a fake, uh, it's a fake lotus posture. It's wrong. Should not happen. Some very flexible people are able to sit in Mahapalanka without having any space between the uh, between the knee and the floor, but that's very rare. If your knee can go entirely to the floor, well, that, that's a good posture for meditation. Otherwise, no, because you get pressure between, uh, the, between the calf and the shin of the other leg, and uh, that can be very bad for your health. So we don't want that, and we want to sit in such a way that it helps on our way and not in such a way that it damages our health. All right, so hopefully you have chosen one of the three recommended postures 
And next, we need to erect our back. We can lower the head or we uh, approach the neck by our chin and then send the head a little back. Some people just move their head a little down and that's not enough. Then they have pain in their neck or in their throat. So that's wrong. Must send our, our head right some people when they send their head back they do this no that's wrong the chin uh, the distance between the chin and the floor must not change at all as we are sending the head back all right only then it is healthy and we need to make sure that whatever is the posture we chose for meditation that it is comfortable at the very moment it is not comfortable, it is wrong, all right? Posture for meditation must be comfortable. Uh, it may be uncomfortable after some time. And in that case, we have to change it. Changing posture, why is that a good thing? Because it does not decrease your enthusiasm to meditate. But, if you decide to change your posture, let's say after 10 minutes or after 15 minutes, or if you meditate long periods, 60 minutes, if you change your posture after, let's say, some period of time, then I would suggest that you change your posture only for maximum three minutes, and then you return to your primary posture. That's the posture in which you started. So rather than just changing posture this way and another way and yet another way and yet another way, it is good to keep it simple and structured. Whenever you feel pain for more than a few minutes and you know that it's not going to decrease, well, then you change your posture. And after you change your posture, you wait for about three minutes until all pain totally disappears and then you can come back to your primary posture, which is exactly the posture in which you started. To summarize, there are two kinds of postures, primary and secondary posture. Primary posture is the posture in which you meditate and you don't move at all. Secondary posture is which you use to relieve pain. In primary posture, you sit as long as you can. In secondary posture, you sit maximum three minutes at once. From secondary posture, you change to primary posture. There is no tertiary posture, no other posture than primary or secondary. Gradually, if you follow this method, you will see that you can sit longer and longer in your primary posture. And after some time, you can entirely avoid uh, changing into the secondary posture. All right. I see one more thing I need to say as we are looking at the postures. There are fakes. There are many fakes. Many people don't want to change into their secondary posture. Either they are lazy or they're conceited. They think, I do not need to change into secondary posture. That's called conceit. Not a skillful mental state. So what do they do? when they have excruciating pain, they fake. And there are two ways how they fake. One way to fake is to lift the knee. So the conceited people who do not progress towards Nibbana, when they have pain, excruciating pain, instead of changing their posture into secondary posture, such as like this, instead of doing that because they are lazy and conceited, they will lift their knee and then they will put it back. This is very unhealthy and they suffer because of that. How do they suffer? By permanent numbness in their leg. So their fake was not for free. They had to pay for it. There is another way how conceited and lazy people fake their meditation. They release or so-called slouch their back 
and then they erect it back. So this is the second way how conceited and lazy people fake their primary posture. Unfortunately, they pay for that. They pay for that by permanent numbness in their leg. And why am I saying that? How do I know that they're lazy and conceited? Because that's exactly what I did. So I know that I was lazy and conceited. And then I had my numbness in my foot. And I had it permanently. But I went to see a neurologist and I got uh, weekly shots into my bum. And now I have my feeling back. This is an incident that happened about 18 years ago. And so those 18 years ago, I have got my experience, I've got my knowledge. And so now I know what's the reason for changing into secondary posture and for not faking. So I would like to encourage everybody to humble yourself and to change to secondary posture when you have pain for a few minutes and see that it doesn't decrease. You will see that if you humble yourself, your meditation will progress faster and gradually you will truly not need to change into secondary posture. So as you are sitting in a true primary posture without lifting the knee or without slouching the back, we will today practice meditation with open eyes. Maybe you have never done that in your life very well. I like that even more. So we will meditate with open eyes because when we close our eyes, there are two problems. One, we fall asleep without even noticing that we are falling asleep. And two, we see total nonsense that we then believe. So we don't want to fall asleep without knowing it. We keep our eyes open. When we start to fall asleep, first the eyelids will have to close and then we fall asleep. So we are well notified about our going to sleep. And when we keep our eyes open, we do not see nonsense pictures. We don't see any dragons or Buddhas or crystal bowls or that kind of nonsense that's not related to our meditation object. So keeping eyes open is very powerful. But there is one more advantage. If you can meditate with opened eyes, you can then easily achieve deep levels of concentration and peace and loving kindness and insight, even during your daily activities. For those who find it difficult, again, work with your humbleness. At the very moment that you're conceited and you think your practice is right and everything else is wrong, this is called conceit and it was rejected by the Buddha. So we always need to be open to the teachings of the Dhamma, and we always need to be open to ways how to improve our understanding and our experience of Dhamma. And so as we are keeping our back erect, eyes a little open, we see the floor in front of us or whatever is there, And we can make the first determination in our minds voicelessly. From now on, for 15 minutes, I will meditate on muscles and radiate loving kindness without any movement. So we will take one of the 32 parts of repulsiveness of the body as the basis for our loving kindness practice. And then we will develop loving kindness based on the peace that we achieved as we accepted the nature of the body. From now on, for 15 minutes, I will meditate on muscles and radiate loving kindness without any movement. From now on, for 15 minutes, I will meditate on muscles and radiate loving kindness without any movement. 
And with that determination, we can gently, lovingly notice the flat piece of sinew at the top of the head. On the skull, there is attached flat piece of sinew. That sinew is a part of a larger piece of flesh which contains the forehead muscle and two small pieces of muscle at the back of the head. It's one piece, but we are now working with the sinew at the top of the head. We allow it to be heavy, so we consider its element of earth. We allow it to change, so we consider its characteristic of impermanence. We don't force it, we don't have to feel it or experience it. We just accept its nature. Suppose at night somebody asks you, does the sun shine? Then you as an intelligent and knowledgeable person can say, yes, the sun shines. But can you see it shining? You can't, it's far away. Can you feel it shining? You can't, it's far away. Can you help it in shining? Again, you can't. So just like we can't see the sun shining at night, we cannot feel it, we cannot help it. In the same way, we can accept the fact that there is a flat piece of sinew at the top of the head and that it has some heaviness, an element of earth, and that it is changing as we are aging. And we continue in this manner, considering heaviness and change in muscles and sinews throughout the body to the forehead. Eyes, nose, lips, chin, cheeks, ears, back of the head, we allow all of the muscles and sinews throughout the head to be heavy and changing. And again, we don't try to experience that. We don't try to feel it or see it. We don't have to. We simply accept that fact. We continue with the neck, shoulders, arms, Elbows, forearms, wrists, palms, fingers, tips of fingers. chest, abdomen, back, we allow all of the muscles and flesh throughout the upper part of the body to be happy. and changing.
we continue to the buttocks, thighs, knees, arms, heels, soles, toes, tips of toes, we allow all of the muscles and flesh, all of the muscles and sinews throughout the body to be happy. and changing. And we allow all of the body parts to be changing. And as we have allowed this body to be the way it is, as we have given freedom to this body to be the way it is, we ourselves achieve freedom from worry about the body. Let's enjoy this freedom. Let's watch this peace. Now, as we have established ourselves in peace, we can share it with other living beings. We don't force, we don't expect, we just allow, permit all beings, including ourselves, to enjoy at least as much peace as we are having now. So in our minds, voicelessly, we can wish. May all beings in this room be in peace. May all beings in this building be in peace. May 
may all beings in this city or village be in peace. May all beings in this country be in peace. May all beings on this planet be in peace. May all beings, including me, be in peace. Now, because the time for this sitting is finished, let's make the last determination in our minds voicelessly. From now on, I will always be called. From now on, I will always be called. From now on, I will always be called. And with that determination, we can slowly, mindfully change the way of our sitting. And so we take one of our legs and put it by the side. So we move on to the secondary posture as I've already shown before. So we keep both of our legs next to ourselves. It's very important to change the posture. So after we have changed the posture by keeping our legs by the side of ourselves, we can take one more minute to enjoy the peace we gained in meditation while we curiously watch the mind.
All right. So now we are fully ready to look at Dhamma. Today we will be talking about workings of Kamma. And we will be following uh, the famous book from Pao Siyado. The system of this um, of this course will be that before this course, before each class, I will read a certain portion in that book and highlight some parts that I believe are very important or very interesting. And then as we meet here, we will be looking at those highlights. Usually I highlight most of the things that are there, but uh, I will be talking about those things. Because although this book is very thorough, very detailed, there are things that can be added and there are also sometimes problems. And we will be looking at those problems as well. Then after this um, a little um, summary or interpretation of my highlights in that book, uh, there will be opportunity for discussion. So if you disagree with anything or if you want to suggest anything or if you would like to correct anything at all, totally fine. I'm most happy to learn from you all. So today we are starting at page one of the book and we will be talking about the clockbound sutta. The clockbound sutta is a little long, uh, is uh, not a long sutta in our scriptures, but it is a, uh, uh, it is interpreted here by Pao Siero in about uh, in about 17 pages. So there's a lot of text and Seattle likes to provide many interesting references and explanations. It is an interpretation. Seattle is sometimes adding his own ideas. Sometimes he is adding a lot of very uh, valuable, uh, very important references. So we'll be looking at that. So uh, we'll be looking at how samsara or the round of rebirth um, looks like, what is it? And uh, this sutta provides us with an interesting detail, not only in the conceptual sense, but also in the ultimate sense. So the Buddha says, inconceivable is the beginning because of the round of rebirth, samsara. A first point is not known of ignorance hindered beings, avijja nivarana nang satanang, fettered by craving tanha sangyojana nang, rushing on sandhavatang and running about sangsaratang. So, what is in the bold is the Buddha's word, and then whatever is not in bold is not the Buddha's word, it is Pausiero's explanation. So two main causes for the ongoing process of running through the cycle of rebirth, ignorance and craving, avijja tanha. With ignorance and craving, it is possible to accrue kamma. Without ignorance, without craving, you cannot really make any kamma. That's why arahants do not make any new kamma. The kammik potency is the potency by which volitional action through body, speech, or mind is able to produce a kamma result, kamma vipaka. So, kammik potency is a fancy word for kamma. All kamma in the Buddhist philosophy will bring about result, except, of course, special exceptions such as when it disappears. 
We know disappeared kamma as aho se kamma. That's in case if somebody becomes an arahant, they still experience uh, consequences of their kamma during their last life as an arahant. But after they pass away, there is no more consequence of any kamma. They pass away into nibbana. So the person passes into nibbana, kamma disappears for the next life. And um, so uh, from that, we can see that without ignorance, without craving, there is no new kamma, but the old kamma still can bring about result until the moment that an arahant passes away. So uh, here we get um, a synonym for kammik potency, and that is other moment kamma, nana kanika kamma. It means that this kamma, this kind of action, kamma just means action in Pali language, but in Buddhist philosophy, it means volitional action. Volition means intention. So it's a, an action that's done intentionally. If it is done unintentionally, it is no more kamma. That's why the Buddha says, say, chetana hampikkave kamma vadami. It is the intention that I call kamma monks. So we need to be careful only when there is intention. It is called kamma, but intention is not enough. You'll have to uh, also have ignorance and craving. So other moment kamma means any action that brings about consequence in another moment. That means in the future. There is also kamma that does not bring really other consequence in the way as we have here. For example, building, building a house or um, making a chair or making a table. Those are also kammas, but they do not really bring other consequence in uh, terms of pleasure or happiness as we know it from the philosophical kamma. So kamma is action in a very mundane, worldly sense, but it also can be action in this philosophical sense. The kammic potency produces the result at another moment. So that's the nana kanika kamma. Now here we get some explanation on why is this sutta called clog, but uh, we will be uh, looking at that a little later. Uh, as for sangsara, um, Pa Auxiado is here uh, quoting Pali English Dictionary, uh, saying that sangsarati is uh, that the sangsarati. Well, okay, sangsarati. Uh, is coming from the words sang and sarati. That means uh, sang in the same way, all right, run, run on. Well, sang only also means altogether. So running again and again and again in the same way is a little weird. No problem. It's a quote from Pali English Dictionary. While each volitional formation arises and perishes, its inherent coming potency, kamma sati, remains in that same mentality, materiality, continuity. So this is a cryptic statement. It doesn't really tell us uh, how kamma works. And for me, um, I'm also trying to find a proper reference for a proper explanation of how does kamma work without any soul. <clears throat> So the idea of um, the kamma traveling uh, through some kind of um, vehicle uh, was very much proposed by the so-called Vijnanavadis. No, uh, yes, I think Vijnanavadis, Putkalavadis, it's, that's right. So Putkalavadis, also known as Vatsi Putriyas, Vatsi Putriyas. So they believe that there needs to be a vehicle that will carry the kamma from one life to another. Uh, well, we do not really necessarily need to talk about from one life to another. We will need to talk also from one moment to another. 
how is it possible that your kamma from last minute is still there with you this minute? Why didn't it disappear right after that? If all, all your mentality is entirely destroyed and appears entirely new billions of times every second. So there are different interpretations for that, even in Theravada. And in Theravada, one of the interpretations, which I find to be very rare, and again, I get no reference in the Pali scriptures, is that whenever we, we do some action, be it a good or bad, as kamma, then it sticks to our javanas. So in Theravada, we understand uh, the mind as a kind of succession of moments, which is relatively regular. So this succession of moments that make up our mental stream can be further divided into so-called citta vite. So let's call them sections, sections of the mental process. Each of these sections starts by several bhavangas, exactly there are three, and it also ends by a bhavanga. In the middle, uh, there are several um, interesting moments, uh, but I don't want to go too much off topic today. And we'll really go a lot of the off topic, off topic, but let's do our best. There at one point comes the moment of intention. There comes the moment of creating Kamma, and they are the so-called Javana moments. So each and every section of the mental process, when we are awake, contains these Javana moments. They are altogether seven. So these Javana moments are believed to somehow contain Kamma. I have heard it from a Sri Lankan uh, master. I have heard it from a Burmese master. But neither of the two provide any reference whatsoever to our scriptures. So there we have two problems. One is we need a reference. But second problem is that they do not further explain this process. So I'd say that it's an explanation that doesn't explain anything. Moreover, uh, there we have a little problem. So if gamma can be stored in uh in uh, these javanas then isn't it so that the uh that the gamma is somehow implying permanence that it's somehow implying that this that these javanas are uh that they are permanent wouldn't the javana have to stay some time so that it can actually really register this kamma? Or how would it happen that the kamma still moves from this one javana to another javana or from one process to another process if they are separated by the bhavangas, they're separated by other mental moments? So that, of course, is not explained at all. Now, my idea... Uh, is that there is the main problem, namely that the Buddha did not say this. So what did the Buddha say? The Buddha said that we cannot understand Kamma. It's, it's just that simple. Now, my takeaway is that Kamma doesn't really have to be carried by anything. What if, they, what if Kamma just doesn't have to be carried by anything? Why do we always need to interpret things based on that what we have experienced? What if things are sometimes different? So if it is true, then I don't see any problem why a condition could bring an effect later in the future without any intermediate, um, without any intermediate articles or particles that would have to carry it or that would have to come in between so again here we have this problem it's not explained uh, maybe Paok Sero will explain how exactly the karmic potency remains in that continuity 
let's make it gray so that later we can find it again if, if needed. But how does the comic potency remain in the continuity? All right. So amongst the ultimately non-existent, amongst women, men, it hurries on. Amongst the existent, however, amongst the aggreg aggregates, etc., it does not hurry on. So this is, uh, again, a cryptic statement, uh, but uh, it's from commentary, and we can take it from the poly right away. So uh, this is taken. This is taken from from this uh, uh, from the sutta called Blockdown Sutta, Gadula Sutta. But we get a beautiful etymology of the word avijja in the Itivuttaka commentary. So it provides actually two etymologies. One is anta virahite sansare satte java petiti. Okay. So in uh, so because it makes living beings run in the uh, cycle of rebirth or in the sangsara that has no end. Anta means end. Virahite, it doesn't have. Absent. It is therefore called avijja. Uh, now we have here a problem because the Buddha did not really answer whether the sangsara is infinite or whether it is finite. So here I worry that the commentaries is um, playing the Buddha a little. Now we get a second uh, definition here. Paramatthatova avijjamane su itthi purisadi su javati pavattati vijjamane su kandhadi su na javati na pavattiti avijja. So this ignorance. So it's uh, the same thing that we have here, except we have it in Pali. So in the ultimate sense, however, this ignorance does run and continues in the ladies and men, namely in the, uh, in, uh, yes, amongst, yes, ladies and um, men uh, of ignorance. However, uh, this ignorance does not run or continue in the uh, five aggregates, which can be known by uh, insight knowledge. So as soon as you have insight knowledge, you are free from avijja, especially if it's an arahant level insight knowledge. However, if you don't have it, well then you will still perceive men and women. The perception of men and women is important even for arahants. However, um, it's important also to know that it's only conceptual perception, that it's not the ultimate reality. So ignorance sees only conventional truth. It sees women, men, and others. Now, the mothers and fathers is a problem, and later there is a footnote that says that it's a problem, but we will talk about it probably later. It is wrong to see in this way because these things do not exist according to the reality. So it is very important to see men, women, and in particular, mothers and fathers, however, only as a conceptual reality, not as an ultimate reality. Things that do exist according to reality, such as the aggregates, uh, elements, uh, the basis, like the sixth sense basis, then uh, materiality, uh, uh, well, it's mind and matter, mind and the body, dependent origination, uh, then uh, gamma, three characteristics, the four noble truths. So these things are the ultimate truth, and that's what the ignorance doesn't see. In other words, it's the knowledge, it's the wisdom that can see these things. 
All right. So, so now again, we get a little interpretation of what is avidya. So avidya, uh, ignorance, is not knowledge of suffering and so on for noble truths. It's not knowledge of past, future, and the past and future. It's not, uh, uh, which is again the dependent origination. It's not knowledge of uh, dependent origination. Okay, so that's actually synonym. Then Visuddhimagga explains that ignorance is again uh, when origin, cessation, the path, so the four noble truths, so uh, then the five aggregates, namely as the past, uh, the coming five aggregates called the future and the both specific causality and dependently originated things, both specifically cause dependently originated things, so they are all concealed. So again, it's four noble truths and it's the dependent origination. Then what else? The characteristic of impermanence as well as uh, unsatisfactoriness as well as not self are not visible through ignorance. How is this possible? Ignorance um, uh, conceals the continuity of the arising passing moments of the mind. Um, unsatisfactoriness doesn't appear due to postures. That's why I like to say um, if you have pain in your meditation posture, you're not meditating. You should not have pain in your meditation posture. There's no uh, scriptural support for having any pain in your legs during your meditation posture. Sorry. So if you have pain in your meditation posture, it just shows you're not meditating right. The characteristic of non-self does not appear owning to not keeping in mind, not penetrating the resolution into various elements. So the dhatu, uh, but uh, in this case, I uh, I believe that they mean by dhatu not only the material elements, but also the mental elements. So we consider eight elements so there are the four elements of matter, four elements of mind, four elements of mind are Vedana, Sanya, Sankhara, Vinyana. All right, so now let's look at uh, Pao Siedo's explanation. So he's talking about the necessity uh, to see the Kalapas. Pao Siedo emphasizes the knowledge of, uh, of Kalapas, of materiality, through psychic powers. So Pao Xero would like to see us all achieving the fourth jhana and through fourth jhana uh, achieve powerful penetrative light that, that can help us see the 32 parts of the body as four elements or better as the 28 materialities. Uh, but uh, we do not really have scriptural support for that kind of instruction. So uh, Pao Xero there is uh, going a little overboard, but um, it seems that it helps a lot of people. So definitely uh, talking about materialities is very interesting. However, uh, we do not really have scriptural support that we need to see that. And we can see that apart from Pao Xero, um, neither the Pali scriptures nor the Burmese masters ever say that you must see the Kalapas. Then when Pao Xero starts to say that you have to see the mental Kalapas, that means uh, the, the particular uh, mental moments, namely the 81 consciousnesses, then uh, that's going even further uh, beyond uh, the scope of our scriptures because as we know, for example, from Lady Siado, it is not actually possible for a non-Buddha to see the moments of the mind. So Pao Xero would like to see us all to become Buddhas, and only when we become Buddhas, we are eligible to become enlightened. As you can see, it doesn't make much sense. If we analyze those small particles, we see ultimate materiality. Altogether, 28 types of materiality. There is also mentality, which depends on materiality. If we analyze those consciousness moments, we see ultimate mentality, altogether 81 types of consciousness and their associated mental factors. 
You have probably heard of 89 types of consciousness, but Sero here explains that the eight types of consciousness that are related to Nibbana do not count as meditation objects. I don't know, but I wonder if Us Upasamanu Sati actually takes Nibbana as its object. So if that's true, then actually it is 89 consciousnesses. All right, so then what else? There come, yes, so we have now finished a little chapter on on the uh, ultimate nature of sangsar. Now we will be looking into some concepts. So maybe what we can do, we have several options now what we can do. So what we can do is we can do now questions, answers. So if you have any questions, answers, uh, I've been very critical and some of you may have not appreciated my critical way of speaking. I'm totally fine with that. So if you have any questions, any concerns, I'd like to know about it. And um, uh, then if there are some questions, answers, I, uh, let's go through that. And then we can continue next time. Or if you, yes, I think it's better to continue next time. Because today it has been a little too much. We were talking in detail about meditation. We were talking uh, in detail about uh, the ultimate reality of samsara. So I think maybe it's uh, better if you let it fertilize in your minds. And maybe you will get something interesting, such as questions that you would ask me next time. But if there are any questions already now, I would like to invite you, everybody, to ask me. All right. Those who are watching us uh, in the live stream can ask their questions in the comments. And um, then hopefully our most meritorious uh, gentleman, Mr. Suminda, uh, will have some time to look at the comments and maybe raise the questions next time. So, Mr. Suminda, how do you see it? Do you think um, uh, it is good to wind up in here? Or do you have any uh, other suggestions? Yes, one, uh, Bante, I think uh, it's good as you suggest, let things sink in. And uh, we'll uh, uh, try to see if uh, uh, the questions can come in. And as Bante said, everybody, you know, you can uh, leave your, uh, leave your uh, comments uh, on our YouTube channel or our Facebook page, uh, those things uh, we can take up with Bhante for, uh, for the next lesson. Very nice. So it was a pleasure to see everybody. I wish you that you are all happy, that you are healthy, and that you are successful in everything you do. And much merit for you, Bhante, for uh, doing this course. And uh, the...